Good evening, guys. Glad you're here. You guys online. Hello, hello, hello. We're going to get into our 12th session lesson class for a school of ministry tonight. So everybody got a handout for you guys online. You can get that on our website. Uh, the PDF is there for tonight's. And tonight we're going to be looking at servant leadership once again, and this will be our last class around servant leadership. And we're going to look at the different trials, triumphs uh, that a leader will have, and also the truth of our ministry. Uh, what is it really all about? So that's what we have in store for us tonight. And if you guys recall, we hit last time a little bit on Isaiah, and the Lord asks, whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And then I said, here am I, send me. And I think that's what God's looking for when it comes to servants of his. And to be a servant of the Most High, I don't think there's any, anything greater in this life. Uh, but do we have a willingness? And that's what God is looking for. And there's one more scripture I want to throw out on these same lines. It's Second. Chronicles 16, 9. I shared this if you were at the retreat this last weekend. But we're told there that the eyes of the Lord, they run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are loyal to him. So the Lord's looking for those. He's right now looking all over this earth who has a heart that is loyal to him. Not always who has everything together, who would be in the world's eyes a great hero for the faith, smart altogether. No, God's looking for what? Heart, isn't he? That's what he desires. So tonight, guys, we're going to look at the reality of uh, the New Testament call to ministry in the exhortation we find in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 through 4 is where we're going to hang first, and then we're going to change gears a little bit to look at the truth of uh, servant leadership. But uh, we're going to take a look here, and I want to ask a question when we think about circumstances that might make a person lose heart in ministry. Does anything come to your minds? What, what's one of the things that may happen in a person's life where they lose the heart to continue to serve the Lord. Yeah. Is it really making a difference? Is it worth my time, my effort? Things aren't changing. And that's one of the things too, because ministry is to who? To people, right? And it's it's a little different because you don't always see what God's doing in the life of a person. I used to work construction and I enjoyed it because I could see what I accomplished during the day. Like, oh, I built something, that's cool. But when you're discipling someone and loving and serving and pouring into them, you don't always see those things immediately. It might take a long time. So anything else come to mind? What other things may cause a leader to lose heart? Negative, yep. Yeah, yeah, words hurt. Yep. Rejection. That happens a lot, doesn't it? Burnout. Yeah. Warfare. Very real. Yep. Loss, injury, yep, illness. I'm, I'm speaking so everybody online can hear too. <laughs> I'm not trying to cut you off. It's just, I don't know. But yeah, there is just a lot of life situations that come up. But this is where we find the exhortation in Scripture. Second Corinthians 4, if you're not there yet, it says, Therefore, since we have this ministry, this is something as believers we have, right? It says, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. And then if you jump down to verse 16, therefore we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet our inward man is being renewed 
day by day. So as we consider those things, oftentimes a leader may have dreams and expectations in ministry. And do those always come to pass? Absolutely not, okay? A lot of dreams may be had, and there may be seasons of you see things moving and shaking and Oh, and then there's other seasons where it doesn't seem like anything's moving or shaking. Uh, so oftentimes, guys, those things can come up. So what struggles do you expect in ministry? And I think it's good to understand and have a full understanding of those things that we go through as believers in trying to serve the Lord. Because oftentimes we want to make a difference. We want to love on people, but it's not always received. We want to share the good news of Jesus, to share the promises of God, to share his word. But sometimes people are like, ah, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to know about that. Good for you. (laughs) You Uh, So there's a lot of times, guys, that we'll find a lot of struggles in ministry. And primarily, the ministry's people. And you guys know that people, they're hard to work with sometimes. You know, I would love ministry if people weren't involved right? (laughs) But the reality is that is the ministry and that's what we have to keep in mind. So the first parts uh, for tonight, our our subject really, I want to come around the New Testament ministry and overcoming struggles within ministry and then talk about the triumphs we have in trials that we don't lose heart. You guys see the exhortation here in scripture? Don't lose heart. And I've seen so many who used to be in ministry, serving, active, excited about serving. That's why they were active. And they're doing nothing now for the kingdom. They're sitting on their butts. What happened? So how do we do this, not lose heart? Well, I'm glad you asked. Again, attitude's a pretty important thing when it comes to the believer, right? Right? And Christ tells us that we need to have right attitudes. And I think a key is to have an attitude of gratitude. So I want to take a look with you guys in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. You can turn there in your Bibles and jump down to verse 14 with me. Paul writes here, Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of His knowledge in every place. Again, it's going to be through believers. It's going to have this fragrance being diffused of the knowledge of who Jesus is. And then verse 15 goes on to say, For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one, we are the aroma of death leading to death. And to the other, the aroma of death of life leading to life, who is sufficient for these things? So I love that he says in verse 14, thanks be to God, right? You can jot down 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 57, where it talks about us giving thanks to God who gives us victory through Christ Jesus our Lord. So there is triumph in victory in our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we also know that giving thanks is a biblical mandate. You can write down Philippians 4, 6, or 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, where we are commanded by the Lord to give thanks in everything, right? And I think about Acts uh, chapter 16. You remember Paul and Silas? They were in jail in, the, in Philippi there. And what were they doing? Praising God, thankful, an attitude of gratitude, even while being in prison for the gospel. I think that's pretty cool. And I think they're a good example of a right attitude. So we consider verse 15 and 16 here. Do you guys know that in Rome, uh, there would be a procession after a battle that was won as they would go through town all the way to the temple. And to the prisoners, the smell of that incense, that aroma was of death. But to the Romans, okay, that was a sweet-smelling aroma of 
victory. So you guys kind of get the picture when we read these scriptures, there's, there was an understanding for them. So we are to be like incense to God to be this sweet-smelling aroma to God. I want to consider with you guys for a second. We know Mary in the Bible, the one who uh, broke the alabaster flask and anointed the feet of Jesus, this perfume, this oil, costly. And then she wipes the feet of our Lord with her own hair in a way of worship to him. That aroma, that perfume, that sweet-smelling fragrance of worship, okay? John 11, if you want to read on that a little more on your own. Let's look at verse 16 here. Um, who's sufficient? That's the question, and I'm glad that he put this in here because that's a question that all comes to our mind in ministry. Well, who really is sufficient? Because oftentimes we do feel inadequate to the task of really representing God. Isn't that what we're doing as ministers? We're following Christ. We are his disciple. We are an example of him. And we can oftentimes in ministry experience frustration and anger and discouragement, disappointment, distress. Someone mentioned getting dissed, right? These are things we go through, even to the point of depression. I'm amazed. If you guys saw statistics among pastors, ministers, how how many of them go through depression, you would be, you'd be staggered like, whoa, I didn't have any clue. Um, so ministry, testimony um, can often feel insufficient. Uh, but what does God have to say? Well, if we look at our, our second point here, we're going to be in chapter 3 now. You guys can turn over a page. Um, but being in Christ... Okay, Christ's sufficiency is the key. Because we're not to be self-sufficient, right? We are to be God-sufficient. That's the point, and that's what Paul is getting at here. Look at verse 4 with me in chapter 3. And we have such trust through Christ towards God, and not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. So according to 2 Corinthians 3, verses 4 and 5 here, guys, self-sufficient is contrasted with Christ's sufficiency. So we are to be Christ-sufficient. And we see the answer And verse 6 really answers the question of verse 16 previously of who is sufficient. And he who has a New Testament ministry, right? Um, So we think about what God is telling us here. This is a covenant agreement, isn't it? And there really are two kinds uh, of agreements that we see um, in Scripture, okay? When we have two parties, whether they're making a bargain or making a deal or whatever's going on. And the other one then would be like a person, uh, he sets terms, and the other, they accept it or they reject it. So those are the two terms, right? Um, Ways you can come into this. But the testament or the New Testament or will, okay, as we consider these two, we see God, he's the one that establishes the terms. But the problem is that we want to set the terms, isn't it? And that's where we get in trouble in ministry. We're, oh, God, we know that we're doing this for you. We're serving you ultimately. But we're the ones who can set the terms on what that looks like and how that's supposed to happen. We want God to bless our plan in our expectations rather than yielding to what he asks us to do. And sometimes we think, well, that's beneath me or that's too hard, okay? Or I've been doing this so long, Lord. Time time for a change here, right? <laughs> so the new covenant is kainos, okay? A new requality or nature, not merely new in a sense of time, guys. 
So the Old Covenant or Old Testament refers to the Mosaic law, doesn't it? But the law leads to death. That's the problem. And James 2.10 speaks to that very clearly. So the purpose of the law is to show us that we are sinners who are in need of a Savior, not to make us right with God. So the Old Testament focuses on religious observations, man's work, and then we have the contrast here, and this is the point that Paul is trying to drive home for you and I with the New Testament teaching. It focuses on God's grace through faith, and that really is what? Christ's work through us, guys. Please understand this and grasp this truth. These scriptures here in Corinthians are so freeing, so eye-opening. It brings clarity to what God is doing. And I think of even the Old Testament speaking to that. Jot down Jeremiah 31, 31. Isn't that the passage of the promise of the new covenant being given to the Jews? But we who believe in Christ receive the benefits of that covenant. Do we really, Pastor? Read Hebrews 9 and 10 later tonight. You, you'll totally understand. Like, whoa, it, it is. This is what God has done even for us as Gentiles. So 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 25, the symbol of the new covenant is the Lord's blood. And we remember that every time we come to the Lord's table don't we? It's a covenant that he has made, a new covenant in his blood. It is his grace, his spirit at work. Now, thirdly, I want to look at the characteristics of the new covenant. We're going to look at chapter 3 once again. Jump down to verse 6 this time. It told us there that it's the spirit who gives life, but verse 7, but if the ministry of death written and engraved on stones That was glorious, right? The Ten Commandments. (laughs) So the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which the glory was what? It was passing away, wasn't it? And how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? You see what Paul, the contrast he's making here? This is much better. And he tells us in verse 9, for if the ministry of condemnation, if that had any glory, right? The ministry of righteousness, which exceeds, is going to have much more glory. And isn't that beautiful? Aren't you guys glad that we live on this side of the cross? I sure do, right? So what I want us to catch here, first of all, the spiritual. The law says do, but the spirit says done. Right? Right. So the law shows our need for Christ. It is a schoolmaster, Galatians tells us, to show us that we need a Savior. So if we look at verses 6, 7, and 8, the Spirit gives life. In then verse 9, instead of condemnation, it gives, whoops, it gives righteousness, right? So we are to share the message of grace, okay? You are accepted in Christ, What a beautiful ministry to have. Look at what Jesus has done. And there are so many guys that have no idea of what Jesus has really done for them. Oh, I know of Jesus. Cute little baby. Christmas is my favorite holiday. That little baby grew up for a purpose, guys, and he died upon a cross for a purpose. He rose again for a purpose. And he's coming back again for a purpose. So how to have this new covenant or the New Testament ministry? Let's look at chapter 4 now together because this ministry, the new covenant that we saw in chapter 3, verse 6, explained here. Verse 1 of chapter 4, Therefore, since we have this ministry, we have it, and we have received mercy, we don't lose heart. There's going to be trials, brothers and sisters, in ministry. But we don't lose heart. Not because it's hard, but because God is good. And one of Satan's primary goals, guys, when it tells us not to lose heart, he wants, his primary goal, okay, his tools, he wants us 
to be inoperative or he wants us as ministers to live a life of discouragement, to be defeated when it comes to ministry. But verse 2, we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in the craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Do you guys understand how important sound doctrine is? Okay, we're not to use it for our selfish gains. This morning we were in our men's study and we're going through Titus. And just a short epistle to a church, just once again being reminded of how important sound doctrine is. That is our job, guys, as believers. We needed to get it right so we can give it right to others, right? Right. So, don't compromise the word, but we're to teach it, right? Teach the truth. Don't manipulate it. Don't strive, okay? Shame, guilt, whatever. We stick to the word, and that's what we teach. Look at verse 3 with me. But even if the gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing. And I want you to catch why people don't come to the gospel here in verse 4. Whose mind's the God of this age, and that is who? Satan, right? The God of this age has blinded who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of, of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. For we don't preach ourselves, but Christ, Jesus the Lord. In ourselves, we're just slaves. We're bond servants for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness and has shone in the hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We're hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed wow so verses three through nine let the light out we're earthen vessels aren't we guys clay pots okay we are cheap pots and it's what's inside that matters that's the important part do you guys get that what's on the inside the light of the good news of jesus christ right i've been born again with the spirit so Paul moves this metaphor from aroma to light. Did you guys catch that? Five times in these verses, light comes up. Okay? Get this. We are the light of the world. Jesus said that. Well, I don't feel like a light, right? You are the light. Maybe you have a basket covering your light. Knock it off. Shine, right? So how does the light get out? Okay, pour it out, comes out. When the pitcher is bumped, verse 8 and 9, no, the pot may be broken, okay? And God, God allows that to happen. And God will allow things in our lives to humble us. Do you know that? He loves us enough. I think of Gideon. Okay, you guys remember the torches in the pitchers? The vessels had to be broken for the light to come out. That's what had to happen. And we need to be broken, ministers of the Most High, servants of Yahweh. You need to be broken in order to shine bright for Jesus. Say, so Pastor, that's pretty good. That's what Paul's laying down for us. That's what he is trying to communicate. He goes on in verse 10. Check this out. We're always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So then death is working in us, but life in you. And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, 
I believed, therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. So as we consider these verses here, 10 on through 14 here, um, there's a need to be crucified, right? Didn't Jesus say, pick up, your, pick up your cross and you follow me? And that's something we're told to do how often? Daily. Whoa, but I served you that one time, Lord, remember? I showed up. I even, I even sweat. It was hard work. No, oh, daily, right? And we see that played out in Galatians 2.20. I love this verse. It may be my favorite. I have like five or ten dozen favorite verses. But um, <laughs> Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ, right? It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And I don't set aside the grace of God For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. Oh, yep. Do you guys know that you've been bought with a price? You're no longer your own. And the life we should live is a crucified life. Well, how do I serve the Lord? You live a crucified life. It's not me. It's not what I want. Not my will be done, Father, but your will will be done whatever you want no matter how big or how small it might be whatever you want so let's go back to chapter 4 for a moment uh, in 2 Corinthians verse 15 because we see results then of this new covenant and I'm so glad that Paul included this he says for all things verse 15 are for your sakes that grace, having spread through the many, may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet our inward man is being renewed day by day. Do you guys see the grace there? Do you see the gratitude? Do you see the glory of God? Therefore, we don't lose heart. This is what's happening in our lives. This is what God is doing through his servants. Oh, don't lose heart, guys. Cool. All right, we're going to change gears. Hey, we're doing great on time, too. All right, check this out. We're going to look at the truth of ministry. We just looked at the trials, the triumphs, okay? Expect that. There's going to be a lot of highs and lows in ministry, um, but again, it is all for the glory of God. It's his, it is his working and doing. Now, the second part of our time together in this class is I want to look at the leader's truth, okay? Because when we are ministering, we're truly ministering to who? The Lord. When you're loving your neighbor, you're ministering to the Lord. When you gave that person a cold cup of water, you're ministering to the Lord. When you clothed that person who was naked, when you took in that stranger, when you visited that prisoner, when you've done these things. And it's so cool, guys, because when we're in the Spirit and do it, and it's not like, oh, look at what I'm doing. When did we do these things, Lord? It's him really doing the work in and through us. We're just that vessel that is willing I want to turn to Acts 13 to consider this truth with you guys. And as we consider ministering to God, it really is the duty of all believers. Everyone who's been born again. You're not just born again spiritually, but you're really, I mean, that encompasses a lot, doesn't it? Because you're born into a new family. You now have a new dad, a heavenly dad, a heavenly father, and we get to be about our father's business as his kids. Everything changes, doesn't it? So ministering to God is the duty for all who call on the name of Jesus, who are truly his. 
And how can people minister to the Lord? I'm so glad you asked because that's what we're going to spend our time wrapping up with. Let's take a look at Acts 13 together. Now, in the church that was in Antioch, there was a certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate from me, Paul, or Barnabas and, and Saul, that's Paul, for the work in which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them and sent them their way. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. And when they arrived at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they also had John as their assistant. So, this part specifically ministering to the Lord, it is so important, guys, when we are, that we are serving God with right motives. Okay, you can jot that on your piece of paper. Right motives. So important. Can we have wrong motives? Absolutely, and I'm going to talk about those in a little bit. But first, (laughs) I want to ask a question. What are some of the dangers of being focused on the ministry more than Jesus? Oh, you guys get to answer. What's, What's the danger there when we get more focused on the ministry than on Jesus? Where do we get our directions from? From the Lord. But if we're looking at the ministry, where are we getting directions from? Ooh, what do the people need? Okay. I remember, and I was really embarrassed. Did I share this with you guys? I might have shared this in our first couple. I was at a church, and I invited my mom to my new church, and she was the only one that showed up with a Bible. Did I share that with you guys? No, and it just happened to be the morning I was so embarrassed. I had my Bible too, but I think we're the only two <laughs> in our area. She came with, and I'm like, oh, you got to see my new church. It's hip. It's happening. Worship's phenomenal. Preaching's fun. The spirit's moving. And you go to that Bible church, that dead mom, <laughs> you know. Anyways, that morning, the pastor had handed out a questionnaire to the entire church of what they wanted specifically in ministry. They were taking a survey from the people to determine what they should be doing in ministry. So I'm sitting there and my mom with her nice handwriting, I see what she's writing because I can read it so clearly because it's such nice handwriting. And she just wrote, I think it is so strange that the saints come to church without their Bibles. I'm like, whoa. Ouch. And I did. As I read that, I, I started looking around. I'm looking down my row. Oh, nobody down our row has a Bible. I'm checking out behind me. I'm like, that's so true. Nobody has their Bibles here. Anyways, point back, there are a lot of dangers that can come because we begin looking to man to determine what ministry is supposed to look like. And it can turn into a lot of things, even good things. Hey, it's social justice. It's all about that. You know, or hey, we got to take the charge with, you know, politics and 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 lead the way in that because that's going to change everything. It's so easily you can just get off on a lot of different things. Anyways, the point here, guys, and what I want you guys to see is what it really means to minister to God, because here we have this church in Antioch, right? Okay. They minister to the Lord. So sometimes that term is translated worship. Okay, and that may be in your Bible. So the term is a picture of service to God performed by the Old Testament priests in the tabernacle or at the temple. So at Antioch, they were ministering to the Lord. Did you guys catch that there in verse 2? They were ministering to him. So it's characterized by what? Prayer, fasting, 
and seeking God through the prophets and teachers. Very, very important. And I think the church today, we don't pray as we ought. A house should be called a house of prayer. We have a hard time, if we're honest, getting people out for our prayer gatherings. Okay? Fasting's a hard thing. You know, I can even ask other leaders to fast, and no one will. And then, where's the prophetic voice of the Lord? Where is the teaching from God? And I believe we would have those prophetic voices in that clear teaching when we really are praying. We really are fasting. Are we really seeking the Lord? Because when we seek him, that's when ministry gets really clear. This is what God is wanting to do. And it might be something totally different than what we've ever done before. Okay, This morning I hijacked our men's Bible study for about 15 minutes. I've been praying for weeks and weeks and weeks about children's ministry. I think they are the most overlooked part of the church in a lot of ways. Okay? And God's been confirming that in a lot of ways of late. But it's not just ministry to them within the church, but in the way of outreach. Where is the church outreaching to children? We just don't see that happening. Sonny and I got to take a dinner in a couple years for the Children's Evangelism Foundation. Beautiful ministry. They're the ones that do the good news clubs. You guys know what those are? Most of you are shaking your heads. There's a few of you guys. That's because you you lived outside of the valley. Do you know of any within inside the valley here? Isn't that crazy? They're all over the United States. Why aren't they here? And this is where a church will adopt a school, go in, and God's people will actually put on a club that is gospel-centered. After school, tons of kids come out to these things, but they can't get any going here in the valley for some reason. What's going on? It's an area that's being overlooked. And I think if we really fast and pray like, God, what do you want? What are you doing? That's when I think he begins to give you insight and download. And it might be a move. I want you to move. I'm doing something over here. I want you here. Well, that's not what the church does. Hmm. I want to see where the church is all about, hey, you need to come together in these four walls and and hide. Have your holy huddles. That's what they're calling them now. It's just like, no, we're called to go. Anyways, I'm getting on my soapbox here. The point is we need to be people of prayer. We need to actually fast, not just talk about it. And let's get real, when's the last time you actually fasted, okay? When are you seeking the Lord in what ministry he has? I think if we really seek him, you might, I think people don't want to do it because they're scared of what God might ask. That's going to take faith. That's going to be a sacrifice. Like, whoa. That's kind of how ministry works, doesn't it? Step out and see what God will do. Just do I did something different today I haven't done. I just made up a big cardboard sign and I sat out in our parking lot for a few hours. It was beautiful out today. But I'm just like, need prayer or you need to talk? Question mark. And sure enough, people pulled in the parking lot here. Need opportunities to pray and to minister to people. So cool. So cool. I'm going to do it again. But that's something God's been putting on my heart all summer. Summer's gone, guys. Winter's around the corner. And I finally stepped out and I'm like, oh, Lord, I'm just going to make it happen. I have other things I need to do, but this is what's in your heart and what you've been asking me to do. And let me tell you what, guys, I would rather do that any day than what I normally have to do. Anyways, let's look at some examples real quick. Um of ministering to the Lord, liturgio. It's where we get our English word, liturgy, right? Um, and really, liturgy is just worship to God, isn't it? Okay, it's, it's the service that we do in the house of the Lord. Uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 2, or 23. Um, you guys remember Zechariah was ministering to the Lord there? And then God showed up, right? Okay. He was the dad of John the Baptist. 
You guys can jot down Hebrews 10, 11, and every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices. So the Spirit, okay, he's the one who prompted giving, okay? 2 Corinthians 9, 12, Romans 15, 27. So there's also the reality of giving. So we serve in the house of the Lord. We're going to be giving according to the Spirit, And isn't it cool when the Spirit prompts you to give? You know it's of the Lord because you always see needs and sometimes you just get prompted. The Churchills, every single time we see somebody on the corner holding a cardboard, you know, sign saying they're in need, we pull over every single time and give them some money. No, (laughs) we hardly ever do that. Right, Churchills? Okay, but here's a funny one. When was that, Sonny? It was sometime in the last year. It's, uh, so off of 41, okay, Sonny pulls off, and there's a mom in need, and she felt led to actually pull her over and give her money, you know? Well, Sonny gets home, and she's telling me about this, and I'm like, hey, it was this gal, blah, blah, in her story. I did the same thing. The Lord put it on my, we don't do this, but the Spirit just led me. No, you pull over, you have a conversation with her, and you give her some money. It's just like, okay, God, (laughs) like there was the confirmation in that. So it's just one of those things, it's got to be spirit-led giving, okay? And then we see sacrificial service, Philippians 2, 17. And here, you know, a more excellent way is given, okay, when it comes to ministry, the more excellent way. Um, You guys, we have the new high priest, a new testament hebrews 8 6 why is it more excellent but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry as or in as much as he also is a mediator of a better covenant right jesus i mean what he established right way better and this was established on better promises and there's three reasons i have them up here because i don't want you guys to miss it okay Three reasons. The better covenant, one, is because it's grace versus law, right? Wow! It is God's grace. No one could be saved by the law. We are saved by grace. I would say that's way, way better, right? Also, better promises, okay? Eternal relationship with God? Oh, I don't know. The promised land flowing with milk and honey, that's pretty sweet. Even though there's a bunch of unbelievers there, we're going to cause us a lot of problems. It's still flowing with milk and honey. What would you guys rather have? Milk and honey or a relationship with God? Relationship with God, right? <laughs> and then a better motive, okay? Love any day over fear. Would you guys say that this is way better? Absolutely. So we can't minister to people until we really minister to the Lord, So when we minister to people, we're ministering to the Lord, but this is a result of first ministering to the Lord. Like that's when we really connect with people and we are rightly serving them. We cannot deliver to others until we first delivered, uh, been delivered to us from the Lord, right? It's an overflow. It's a living water flowing into us and out of us, torrents of living water water. 1 Corinthians 15, 3, you can jot that down. So before going out on a missionary effort and before you ever evangelize, they minister to the Lord. That is so important. Worship the Lord and see what God happens or what happens. So the church exists primarily really to worship, right? Okay. We, we are. We're the temple of the living God. We're to minister to the Lord. Although the study of God's word and evangelizing, okay, very essential roles in the church. So our purpose is to worship and to appreciate God. And the chief activity of heaven is worship, right? Revelation 4. So we are to become worshipers more than just merely students, There's a lot of academia, education within the church. And I love teaching the word. Like Sunday, I could geek out on the Greek. Like I had so much fun studying. 
That's what I was doing in between prayers today out, out in the parking lot. I was just got my Bible software and I'm looking through the Greek. Fascinating stuff. But I've had a conviction over the years in the preaching of God's word, the teaching of it. We do need to learn. We need to be educated. The whole counsel of God is very important to grasp doctrine, to get theology correct. But I also want to inspire I want you guys to really grasp who God is. Not just what he does, but who he is. Because if we really grasp who he is, we're really going to be worshiping him. And if we are inspired to worship him, what's going to happen? We're going to want to serve him. We're going to want to minister to the Lord, which will result in ministering to people. So being with Jesus that really is number one. That is what should come first. And then we serve Jesus by serving others. Luke 10, 38, you guys remember Martha rebuked her sister Mary for not serving the Lord? But Jesus corrected Martha. And uh, really for exalting work for the Lord above worshiping the Lord. So Mary sought to sit at the feet of Jesus and to receive from him And this ministered to the Lord more than any act of service uh, that she could do. So as we minister to God, he guides and he directs our lives. And he ministers to us. So the church in Antioch, they sought to deny the flesh and to feed the spirit as they prayed and as they fasted. So we are seeking the Lord and they sought to minister to him. So when the church ministered to the Lord, God spoke and really directed Barnabas and Paul to go on their first missionary journey. That's pretty cool. So likely, guys, the Holy Spirit spoke through one uh, one of the prophets of the day, someone um, to speak. So God reveals to us, right? Uh, Luke 2, 36 through 38. Um, That's where Anna... You guys recall her in the scriptures? She ministered to the Lord, liturgio, right? And then she saw Jesus. So what are some of the danger signs that you can observe in someone who is trying to serve people without ministering to the Lord first? I think a lot of things may come to our minds, right? But again, guys, as we consider people trying to serve others without first ministering to the Lord, okay, that's going to end ugly. And we see that, okay. Um, I heard the average pastor is, pastorate is about three years, okay. There's 1,500 people, 1,500 pastors every month in the United States that it's calling it quits. And it's like 10% of pastors or 10% actually finish um, their life of working in ministry. They'd given up by then to do something else. And the part of it is burnout, okay? I was on, oh, I'm going to share on this on Sunday, I think. Anyways, there's a neat ministry in Plainfield that is ministering to ministers. Their whole thing is to help come alongside pastors because burnout is a very real thing. And a part of that, guys, is when you're all about ministering to the people and you're not first ministering to the Lord. You know, if you get that backwards, you're going to, it's going to be hard. It's already hard when you're doing it right. (laughs) How much more when you get that backwards. So what's the right motive then? Well, as we serve the Lord, we should consider our motive to minister. Okay, so all of us are called to ministry, guys, not just ministers, pastors, but we're all called to serve. So in that, we should consider our motives. What are they? And one of the primary passages dealing with our motives in ministry and God's rewards is in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 12 to 15. Um, only, it only works with the right motive Okay, and the right motives are rewarded. The analogy of the Bema seat, how many of you guys have heard of the Bema seat before? Okay, awesome. Uh, So that's where awards are given, 
right? We have the Greco-Roman athletic games, and they had the Bema seat. That's where they were given their reward. So that's where we get this idea of the Bema seat of Christ. We will be rewarded for those things which we did for the Lord. All the junk will be burned away, but whatever's left, that will be rewarded for. So Paul describes each work as being tested by fire. The fire represents the test of nature of the motive behind the work. The motive behind the work is more important than the work itself. So what are wrong motives, you know? Well, I want to go through those really quickly. Uh, In Matthew chapter 6, the Sermon on the Mount, the first few verses there, okay, praise from people, okay, can be very dangerous. So the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus, it's kind of open his manifesto, right, for all the kingdom in what he actually thinks, what he wants to emphasize. And it really speaks to attitude more than just merely our behavior. So if we do our good works for God's approval, then he'll reward us openly. But if our works are done with the motive to receive praise from men, well, there's going to be no reward given from God in that So that can be one thing. Another thing can be guilt, guys, okay? Um, Don't serve God because you feel guilty. Not a good thing. Third thing, don't serve so they will be indebted to you. Serve to give, not to receive. Isn't that what we're taught by Jesus, right? Fourth thing, don't serve to draw people to yourself. Draw people to Jesus, Okay, it's not about yourself. Fifth, don't serve for power, position, or promotion. Too often people approach ministry like a corporate ladder that's seeking to uh, just ascend. They begin to serve with a plan to become an assistant leader or a minister, a deacon, an elder, associate pastor, assistant pastor, and then finally, senior pastor. Well, Jesus said what? That the Christian leader would be characterized by his desire to what? Serve. To be the servant of all. That's what Jesus says. So it's their desire to serve rather than seeking a position or power or promotion. And one more, don't serve for profit, right? You guys recall Acts chapter 8, Simon the sorcerer? He thought he could purchase the Holy Spirit. And he wanted that so he could gain money, okay? So financial gain. And he was rebuked by Peter, right? Your money perished with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. So essentially, Peter tells Simon, hey, to hell with you and your money. That's what he's saying there. So God warns us not to serve for financial gain. 1 Timothy chapter 3 is a great chapter when it comes to qualifications for ministry. And I really think if you guys read through there, like, hey, what are the qualifications for a deacon, for a bishop, for a pastor? If you read through there, it's really for all Christians. These are things we all really should be doing. There might be a couple little things like opt to teach. We're not all called and gifted in that way, but we are all called to serve and to live an upright Christian life. So what is the right motive? Glad you asked. The key to ministering, guys, to the Lord is love. Okay? You can write that down in your things. That's the key. It is love. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12 um, through... Um, uh, last verse in chapter 12. Let's turn there real quick. 1 Corinthians And I love this passage of scripture because it's really dealing with, um, well, we already looked at this, 1 Corinthians 3. You guys can look at my slide really cool because I put fire on there. It's being tried through fire. I was getting ahead of myself, okay? And then we looked at wrong motives. Now, what's the right motives? Let's take a look. The last verse of chapter 12 1 uh, Corinthians, but earnestly desire the best gifts. 
And yet I show you a more excellent way. I love this. And then he gets into the love chapter, chapter 13. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I've become a sounding brass or a clinging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and I understand all mystery and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. And whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. More excellent way is to love, guys. Do you get what God is trying to say here? It's to love. When in question, err on the side of love. You see, when Jesus said, go love everybody, it wasn't a suggestion. That's really what he wants us to do. So we're to demonstrate love for Jesus and love for others. Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 to 39 speak to that clearly. Jesus told his disciples in the upper room that he was going to give them a new commandment, that they were to love one another as he loved them. And by this, all would know that they are his disciples. Oh, how will people know that you're a disciple of Jesus Christ? Love. Pretty cool, huh? So, Jesus makes that very clear. And we talked about it last time a little bit in John 13, verses 34 and 35, where Jesus stooped down and washed the feet of the disciples. Wow. Okay? It's loving others more than yourself. That's how far God takes it. Okay? Really caring for others. What if we really did that? We want to be fighting. We'd be loving. Wouldn't it be about me and getting mine? It'd be about really loving. How cool the world would be if we all did that, right? So we are to love as Jesus loved. Okay. And that really is a higher standard. And I'm so grateful that we have the gospels. Isn't it so cool, guys, to be able to read about what Jesus did? and how he lived, how he loved. I want you guys to note, loving one another as he loves, it is a commandment. Okay, it's not like I feel like it, or I'll try that out. No, it's a commandment. It's not a suggestion. Also, our love for others is a demonstration of our love for him. And the last thing I want to note with you tonight, when you serve You serve because you are motivated by love for him and love for others. That's when you really minister to the Lord, guys. That should be our motivation. I love you, Lord. Because I love you, I love others, and I'm willing to serve. I'm willing to go out of my way. I'm willing to do that. So you guys see how important it is for us as ministers of this new covenant. It's his servants that we're doing it with right motives. So important. So that wraps up um, our study for tonight. Next time, uh, we're going to be looking at time management and the importance of that in delegation. Some of you guys recall I took off 40 days into the great upper woods of Minnesota For 40 days, and one of my favorite courses that we did in that time kind of came around time management, and I'm hoping to share some of those insights I learned from tent makers. And also, we're going to dive into some scriptures and look biblically what it looks like for, um, for the leader, the servant of the Lord, how best 
they are to use their time. And as I was looking ahead and considering, I think we might have to take two classes to cover all I want to get through when it comes to our time. And it is important. Okay, as I got together uh, a few weeks back with our pastoral trainees here, that was one of the questions that came up was time management. How do I do this in all the ministry that God's asking? And there are practical, uh, biblical uh, tools and wisdom for us to be had in that. So that'll be our next class. But in the little time we got remaining tonight, um, I want to hit on our homework from last time. Um, and you guys might be asking, well, what's the homework this next week? Um, it, it, it's to minister to the Lord. That's your homework. Be intentional. What is God asking? That's going to take prayer and fasting. Okay, really seek him. And then do what he asks you to do. That simple, okay? Um, But for tonight, guys, I had you take a look at five uh, brothers and sisters of the faith, okay? Uh, Warren Wiersbe's book on 50 people every Christian should know about. And I asked you guys just to briefly put down uh, a little bit just on one of the people. So uh, I'm going to have Finn come up here and grab the mic. You might have to turn it on, um, and we'll just take a few. We got, we got about 10 minutes. Um, we'll just take a few, and you guys can share uh, who you picked. Uh, you can grab that mic right there. Thanks, buddy. Yep, that would be awesome. And Finn's volunteered to go first because he's got the mic in his hand. <laughs> um. Um, I read about someone, Charles something, um, forget, uh, what his last name was. Anyway. Was it Spurgeon? No, it was not him. <laughs> Simeon? I don't think so. <laughs> Look in the front real quick. Do you know when he lived? Because they went by their dates. Oh, it was Charles Simeon. Yeah, there we go. 1759 to 1836. What'd you learn? Um, He became a bishop for the Catholic Church, and he, instead of trying to build big cathedrals with the money donated to the church, he um, wanted to spread God's word, so he used the money to build more churches. So, yeah. I did a lady, of course, (laughs) Fanny Crosby. She's always been one of my favorites um, because she was blind. Uh, One of my biggest fears in life is to go blind. When I got MS, I asked God, please don't touch my sight. And then I read about Fanny Crosby, and I was just like, oh, my goodness. She was blind from the time she was six months old because of a doctor who was just negligent. But she always said that um, she would, if she ever met him again, that she would tell him, thank you, thank you, thank you, because her blindness was such a gift from God. And then she took that, and she, she was just blessed with being able to write poems and stuff. And um, then over time, it ended up developing into hymns, and she wrote over, what did they say? Over like 51 years, over 8,000 songs and hymns. And... Um, she went by 200 different pseudonyms, so it's even there's more hymns out there that are by different names, even by her. And um, she often would write about being able to see Jesus in her verses that she wrote. And um, so when she died, when she was almost 95, um, everybody was like, oh, now she can see her Savior face to face. And it's just a beautiful, beautiful lady. So Chris stole my first choice, <laughs> but I also read about Christmas Evans, um, <laughs> and 
he he was born into like a very poor family on Christmas Day, which is why they named him Christmas. Um, and I don't think his family were believers, but somewhere along the way he came to know the Lord and he became a really powerful preacher and went to like more obscure places. Um, and the Lord just really used him in his ministry. Um, but I liked just the last quote uh, that they had him saying or quoted him saying was, life is the only cure for death, he said, not the prescriptions of duty, not the threats of punishment and damnation, not the arts and refinements of education, but new spiritual divine life. Perhaps that is the prescription we most need today. That's good. Yep. I hope you guys are encouraged um, just in their stories. It's one of those things. It's, um, it's neat to see how God uses ordinary people, you know, even people you think God wouldn't use uh, just in a lot of special ways. And you can be so encouraged in the faith. Um, I'm going through a pretty thick, dense book right now on Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And there's been some uh, biographies and different things written of him over the years. And this one was a little more recent. It's removed. Um, but it's just so encouraging. You know, you guys know his story. Um, he's written some books I really enjoy. Um, Life Together, if you haven't read that one, please do. Um, but he, he was a theologian, right? Um, and it's so cool to think about uh, with Hitler, Germany, all the Lutherans were drinking the Kool-Aid, <laughs> you know, but there were some that really knew the Lord and were convicted and were willing to step up and to do what was needed uh, with this great evil, um, even though their view on the Jews was goofy, you know, he, he understood the scriptures. Um, and that's, that's who God's looking for, you know, who are those who are willing to do what's right, you know, who loves me. Um, and I just want to encourage you guys, you know, spend some time. All 50 are worth reading about. They're not that long. I mean, each one's maybe a 10-minute read. Uh, but just be encouraged by our brothers and sisters who've gone before us. They'll stir us up. And one of the things you're going to see, uh, they're from a lot of different tribes, a lot of different backgrounds, but they all love Jesus. And that's why they stepped out and did great exploits for the glory of our King. So with that, why don't we stand to our feet? We'll close with a song. Prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be Peace.